My name is Pete Moore. I'm the President and CEO of the Ohio Provider Resource Association. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you today. I first want to say that the level of collaboration at this time is extremely high. I want to thank DODD uh, for this opportunity to speak with you. And I, I really want to thank all of the trade associations, opera members, the county boards. We're really at a high level of communication and collaboration. And I think this is so important during this critical time. Our number one goal in the face of the challenge of, of the eventual closing of, of day facilities is to keep day staff engaged as much as possible. We have stated from the beginning that we are going to need every possible person to face the potential challenges that are ahead of us. And when we look at this, there are basically two paths as, as we approach how we can keep those day service folks engaged. And we at Opera, working with our partners, have provided some tools for our providers to enter into these two paths. The first path is a, a day service delivery that is modified. We're looking at creative ways to interact with people. We're looking to help people in their homes, and I'll highlight some of these creative ways in a bit. We're also looking uh, at connecting people by non-traditional means through uh, remote technologies and electronically, and, and we appreciate the support of the department to be able to do these things. The second option is partnering with residential providers through uh, contracts or through uh, day providers delivering HPC services. And our goal there is to cover shifts, provide on behalf of services, be able to go grocery shopping or get medicine, items like that, and, and just providing general support. As I said earlier, it's very important that we keep everybody engaged. And I think when we start to see, and we hope this doesn't happen, but if we start to see a wide spread of the infection in certain communities, we want to make sure we have access to everyone possible. So being flexible with these two options and adjusting as we go, as we all know, this is a very fluid situation. It's going to be maybe important for us to adjust as we go and fill the gaps where they're needed. And this will take a high level of collaboration locally. And we're looking forward to that challenge if it arises. Some of the things that day service professionals are doing that we've heard from our members in a, in a recent call is connecting with local partners to ensure people have what they need. Grocery shopping, getting medicine, any cleaning supplies they need, our day service providers are making themselves available to make that happen. They're helping people connect with friends through social media. They're providing recreational and vocational activities in the home and remotely when possible. Sending home and updating activity packs and totes for the people they, they serve, providing the resources they need to stay active in their homes, to stay engaged, and to keep working on skills so um, they're ready to go when this situation draws to an end. They're looking at small group activity when it is safe and appropriate, so maybe walking through parks or, or walking around the neighborhood, things that they can do to keep that will always keep them safe. They're also doing remote job training to keep skills engaged for people who are looking to, to gain employment. And we've had many people, unfortunately, laid off through this situation. So we just want to make sure we keep people engaged in their skills, uh, ready to go. And many providers have also moved their administrative staff to direct service and keeping all the staff engaged and to reduce agency costs as well. There are many great examples like these that are out there, and we're going to continue to collect these and share these with our partners and provide them in our website at opera.org. And we're also looking at these collaborations and really trying to celebrate those. And there was one yesterday that came up from Clearwater Cog, who is led by Nancy Richards. They've been doing a great job helping providers get connected, day providers with residential providers to help them navigate how to collaborate. And they also are developing a system to identify where staff are. And if we need them in case of emergency, as I pointed out earlier, we're able to identify them and get them engaged as soon as we can. Again, I want to thank all of you for this opportunity and I look forward to more collaboration. Thank you so much. I'm Bridget Gargan. I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Association of County Boards of Developmental Disabilities. On behalf of the county boards, we'd like to thank the leadership of the DeWine administration and the department during these challenging times. Um, it's amazing to live in a state where we can be so proud of the leadership of our governor. To respond to the COVID-19 in a holistic, productive way, 
and to continue to protect the health and safety of people supported by county boards of developmental disabilities, service and support administrators, or SSAs, must be prepared to show flexibility and support local service providers wherever and however is needed. Clearly, local needs must determine where, how, and to the extent to which SSAs are deployed and redeployed. This gives us an opportunity to reevaluate SSA priorities. The response is a statewide crisis of unprecedented proportions. Throughout the response period, county board staff, and especially SSAs, must be prepared to de-emphasize clerical priorities and act to assist people with developmental disabilities through whatever means possible. Following guidance that we received from the Department of Developmental Disabilities, OACB is strongly urging county boards to pull all non-essential SSA staff off plan development and maintenance and reassign them to emergency provider community support. Every action and task must now be measured against the amount of emergency support that could be provided in a comparable amount of time. The department has suspended the in-person requirement for planned meetings and the department has made it clear, albeit unofficially, that regulatory enforcement is not and will not be the state's priority for the duration of the response period, although as always, safety and health are paramount. Regulations on individual service plan development, community integration, should be compiled to the extent possible under the circumstances facing our system. But OACB cannot equivocate on this point. For the duration of this crisis, strict rule compliance must not come before protecting the health, safety, and access to services of people with developmental disabilities and their families. Internal conversations between the Department of Developmental Disabilities and the association have given our topic experts enough assurances to make these recommendations. Reasonable actions taken in the interest of people with developmental disabilities are likely to be censured after the crisis passes. As always, however, the association recommends that boards check with legal counsel if they are unsure of a particular course of action. We are here to support providers. Supporting providers through the crisis must be a top board priority. With the forthcoming closure of adult day service sites across the state, OACB, the department, and the Ohio Provider Resource Association are co-developing administrative and billing processes that will allow providers to shift soon to be surplus adult day service providers to homemaker personal care services and between provider agencies on a temporary basis. DODD has relaxed administrative requirements to make such a shift possible. Accommodating the shift will require an unprecedented level of flexibility from county boards and SSAs. Staff and or SSAs that work in provider relations must begin assessing the current and anticipated needs of providers and moving to fill gaps in support. Counties without dedicated provider support staff might consider reassigning SSAs or other staff to this purpose. The provider matchmaking that this new process will require will necessitate careful coordination to ensure that surplus ADS staff are deployed where needs are most urgent. To that end, OECB is urging all county boards of DD to designate emergency team leaders from among their existing staff to serve in the following roles. A provider coordination lead, we are suggesting one staffer to serve as a primary point of contact for providers responding to this crisis. Main responsibilities include identifying and filling gaps in care by using their unique countywide perspective to match available provider staff with unmet needs. Checking in as needed, daily if necessary, with providers via email, telephone, text message, or some combination to assess and respond to provider needs, ensure that providers are not overwhelmed with offers of assistance by assessing, triaging, and deploying board resources to address urgent needs first. In terms of provider billing, we suggest one staffer to oversee the new financial processes necessitated by crisis management. Main responsibilities would include ensuring that providers are paid and that services are continued at all cost overseeing financial processes that will need to be put in place to accommodate the sharing of ADS and HPC providers. 
and be available to answer providers' financial questions. These responsibilities are intentionally broad and should be adapted to meet the needs of one's county's providers on an ongoing basis. In addition, neither of these positions should operate in isolation. Team members should be reassigned to support these leads in whatever way is deemed necessary. SSAs and other county board staff who are not performing normal duties could be used to assist in any way possible to support providers. County boards and COGS with provider compliance staff should be employed to help perform these functions and perform other duties as needed. My name is Brian Green. I am the superintendent from the Miami County Board of Developmental Disabilities, and I'm also acting as the superintendent's executive committee president and have been meeting with that group quite a, quite a bit over the last two weeks, as most of us probably have. So I think we're in kind of untraditional times, of course, for, for county boards to respond to this crisis. One of the really, I think, inspiring things for me to give me kind of a peek into our world as the county boards, as things happen as boots on the ground, as we're running into a lot of untraditional types of solutions for some of the problems that are coming up and challenges that we're working through. Bridget did a nice job of articulating all of the way that our county board system has changed to respond to this crisis, but I could probably give you a little bit of a preview into how we're actually calling each other and collaborating on a daily basis. Most county boards are likely meeting with their leadership teams, uh, not just once a week, but almost every day, trying to respond to what the SSAs are seeing on the front lines, what we're hearing from our provider liaisons, and trying to answer that need internally with creative measures. I'm also on daily calls with the uh, Association of County Boards and superintendents from across the state, and then we're breaking out into our regions and bouncing ideas off each other, even within those regions. And just kind of a fun example of that is one of the superintendents in, in my region, when we're trying to find personal protection equipment to try to build supplies up so that we could help our providers in our areas had uh, even suggested that they went to Lowe's and to the Home and Garden Center and found masks there that uh, were not a place that we would normally look. So just, you know, some untraditional types of solutions are being shared across the board. And, and I'm really kind of highly encouraged by that and seeing those happen. That being said, I do have some notes that I could cover uh, related to some of the solutions that we're doing. From some of the non-traditional provider supports and organizational examples, most of the county boards are functioning as a hub to match the residential providers that need HPC staff with uh, surplus DSPs that are at the adult day services staff and are coordinating and, and uh, even helping with the subcontracts between some of those. And I know in our county, we've, we've uh, already had people placed from our day services that closed down last week and are now deployed into some of the homes. And uh, early on, it was good in those situations because some of the people were they were familiar with from their day program, they're actually going into their homes and you know having that familiarity for that person being served is important there. So we're checking in with providers to assess uh, the essential medications and their ability to refill and deliver prescriptions. We're deploying resources and we're using County Board to access the suppliers as needed. We're trying to gauge providers to access the disposable medical supplies, such as masks and coveralls, adult diapers, sanitizing wipes, et cetera, and procure and share any additional supplies based on the board's ability. Many county boards are in close contact with their EMA, but uh, a lot of the priorities from those are going to the, those supplies are going to the hospital. So we're, we're trying to do things that we can to try to find the supplies from untraditional means. Kind of a funny story from our county. We kind of busted up our uh, leadership team to try to see what we could find in our building. And we found that we had masks that were in our bed bug supplies and uh, in some of the some of the programs that we had in the, in the building had some storage cabinets where items were stored. And we were able to build a small inventory of gloves, masks, and put together even to-go kits for uh, volunteers that we may have in the future to deliver items to, so that we have a big Ziploc bag. It's got gloves, masks, some Clorox wipes, and uh, and we have an inventory of, and they're not you know, brand new stuff, but some, we may have an inventory in some cases of Clorox wipes that were 30 to a box, but there's, you know, there's only 17 in there, but you know, anything in our mind helps in the situation to help the providers out. 
Uh, we're trying to identify new potential direct support professional recruits that were di displaced from restaurant employees and assist in onboarding those as necessary. I've seen some creative social media calls on on that, and you know I think that we're getting pretty creative in trying to help out with that with that need that's out there and trying to use our direct support professionals through the use of, um, in some cases, county board vehicles or non-traditional means for ride sharing like Uber and Lyft. Some of the non-traditional provider supports for individual staff examples, we're noticing that uh, there's a lot of county boards have shared their own personal cell phone numbers with each other in, uh, which wasn't really kind of a traditional means before, but this situation has forced a lot of our employees to be working from their homes and, and, and learn how to virtually do that. So that's an, it's a new development and a, and a new adjustment on our end. County board channels, uh, we're trying to use social media to share educational content, organize volunteer and donation drives, uh, and provide community updates. One of the other pieces that that I've seen even start out from, from other counties is that they are using social media to just engage the people that we serve just knowing that they're probably going to get cabin fever and they're stuck in their homes and you know can we just engage them into some sort of challenge you know whether it's physical or to get out uh, get outside and get some air and you know um, and challenge each other to maybe talk about some of the positive things that are out there even in, in this crisis and take our mind off of what we're dealing with on a daily basis as we're, as we're confined to our homes. We're also trying to deliver grocery items and medications to the doorsteps of people served in the community. And we're trying to coordinate that through our SSAs and through our provider coordinator based off of the need that's communicated to us. Trying to pick up food bank items and deliver those to group homes if, if those are available, that's happening. Trying to run local donation drives for essential items to deliver to providers on doorsteps with uh, required communication. I see a lot of that happening on uh, social media perform daily well checks via telephone text message with people and family served. We're doing that through our early intervention and in our SSA world to try to uh, determine the health and, and, and what, might, what the need might be for families. We're trying to reach out to personal networks for people willing and able to work and refer them to providers seeking emergency staff. We're trying to assist providers with canceling and rescheduling medical appointments of people served. We're trying to develop and share resources for people, serve families in the community related to public services. For example, utilities, rental, housing, assistance, social security, unemployment, and all those. We're trying to coordinate with the mental health providers who are trying to recalibrate their own services to identify and coordinate additional kinds of support. And we're trying to anticipate higher needs for the support and transportation for people in community employment and, and work ahead to support people with the community and with their jobs. And we're trying to identify where local funds in, in many cases can be used in lieu of Medicaid dollars just to simply support short-term funding solutions while we're dealing with this COVID-19 crisis. And those are some of the kind of an initiatives that, uh, that are not traditional that you would see your SSAs and, and the county board responding to, but we're always open to new ideas. And I think the encouragement that I've had over the last several weeks that we've been kind of preparing for some of this is that we're always seeing new creative ideas from each other. And I'm encouraged that this is the first time in such high frequency, we all have worked together with the provider agencies, with uh, county boards and with DODD to try to develop solutions, remove red tape and obstacles and really move forward in a, um, in a positive manner as one, as one team. So hi everyone, my name is Debbie Jenkins. I'm from the Ohio Healthcare Association. I wanna thank the department for giving me an opportunity to participate in this webinar. I also wanna thank the other associations that have spoken today as well as other associations that we've been working with. This is a challenging time, and I think we all have to work together as one team, as Brian just mentioned. Our goal during this emergency is to keep as many DSPs working during this time as we can. That's taking a lot of creativity from our providers. They've been doing a lot of different things, as Pete mentioned. One of the things that providers also have been doing is really reaching out to the families of the people that they serve, and particularly those who may be on a level one waiver, who may not get regular homemaker personal care supports, or those who may live at home with elderly caregivers. 
These are folks who may really need the support during this time um, while they're not getting the opportunity to go to a day program or get vocational habilitation services during the day. So we really need our providers to be creative. Our suggestion is to work with other agencies as well as contact your county board and work with them. If you are unable to find things for your staff to do, definitely contact your county board and they will assist you in finding ways of putting your staff to work. However, I think right now, what I'd like to do is kind of talk about the opportunity that we have right now. I feel like we have a really big opportunity at this point to bring additional professionals into the direct support professional job creation here. I think there are a lot of people out there right now who don't have jobs. Um, as you know, many restaurants and uh, movie theaters and other retail establishments have been shut down. And so there are a lot of people out there that want to work. And so if we have an opportunity right now to bring those folks into our profession. As Stacy mentioned earlier, the department has been gracious and providing us a lot of flexibility with the new higher requirements. Um, and many of those things that they've put in place will help us to bring new people into um, this field. I also want to talk about the importance of the direct support professional and things that we can be doing right now to show them that they are essential to our services. Uh, many of the DSPs we know are missing out on time with their families. They are putting the needs of the people that they serve above their personal needs or those needs of their family members. And so we as providers can be really creative in the things that we can do to support them. Just wanna give you a couple things that some of our members are doing to show that appreciation for their staff. We have some members who are actually feeding their staff, not just while they are working, but three meals a day. They can eat while they're there on the shift and they can take home food to take with them after they leave for their shift. We have one member who they're doing is transforming one of their day program sites into a child care center to be used for their staff whose children who are no longer allowed to either go to daycare or are not in school because the schools are closed. I just want to give you some information on that. Earlier this week, the governor put into place through the Department of Job and Family Services the ability to create these temporary pandemic licenses for child care centers. One of our members submitted that application Wednesday evening. On Thursday, they got approval from their city for the change of use for the location. And on Friday, the Department of Job and Family Services came out, did their site visit, and they received approval for their temporary pandemic licensure. What they're doing in this case for their child care center is they're able to use their art director and their music director uh, to provide some of those programs for the children of their staff. So I think it's really important for us to be very creative, uh, show our appreciation to our staff members, keep them engaged and working as long as they can during this time. We know some of them will have to take time off, whether that be for an illness that they are experiencing themselves or that someone in their family may be experiencing. But as long as we can keep them working and engaged, when this crisis is over, we will continue to be able to keep them working in our field. Some of the other things that they're doing are transitioning program directors and some of their administrative staff to help with things like creating to-go kits with crafts and art, different educational materials. They're also using technology to provide some of these services remotely to help people to be able to maintain their skills and their abilities. Just on a personal note, last evening through uh, Instagram Live, I attended a yoga class. So it's interesting on the things that we can do from home um, that we didn't think of before, but technology is going to be very helpful during this time. We're also helping staff to keep our individuals connected and engaged with their families and the people who love and care about them, including their friends. We know that many times, People who come to our day programs come and create lasting relationships with others there. So they may not be able to reach out to their friends at this time. And so our DSPs are helping our individuals stay connected, whether that be through using FaceTime or other apps on phones, creating art or cards or letters 
that they can send to their family member and friends using social media and other technology that's available to maintain those connections and those relationships, which is really going to be important as we go through this time period. So we just want to thank everyone out there for all the things that you're doing on a daily basis. If you weren't there and your DSPs weren't there, we wouldn't be able to provide the support and services that people so desperately need. Thank you again for everything that you do. Hello, this is Jason Abadili, CEO of Sunshine Communities in Northwest Ohio. We're a large provider of services with developmental disabilities. Also the president of Values and Faith Alliance, which has members across all parts of Ohio, uh, both large and small, uh, servicing those who support from a residential and vocational perspective across ICFs and waiver settings. At the outset of the outbreak, one of the early decisions we made was to limit exposure, and we actually determined during the week of March 9th to set up procedures to close our vocational and day programming services. We announced that on Friday the 13th, and since then we've had a bit of a head start in the support that both the state and the department have given us in providing services in day residential settings. We've broken out our effort into really key components surrounding communication, uh, staffing, and then action items surrounding how to deliver the best services possible, irrespective of what we were unsure at the time were funding methodologies to do so. Uh, health and safety and quality of life kind of led our efforts, and we stayed in lockstep from a communication standpoint with our peers and our associations throughout the state. Um, our counties have been extremely helpful, and obviously, as, as we've seen from the governor and the director, so have the state agencies. Some of the early steps we took were to try to align our resources that we did have to adjust to schedules that were going to be different during the day. We've used our vocational managers as day programming liaisons, if you will, in each of the two dozen plus homes we have across three counties. We have already begun delivering ADS programming five days a week. We've done so through kind of an exhaustive effort, honestly, around uh, programming, uh, creating activities, uh, making sure that unique and innovative technology solutions are being used so that we have access to uh, outings and um, access to be able to visit educational sites and tours that might be virtual for those that we support. Uh, that technology is also being used for medical efforts to limit our our need to necessarily see and visit the overwhelmed healthcare system right now in emergency rooms and doctor's offices. So using solutions like Station MD and things of that nature. We've worked with families throughout. As you can imagine, uh, most are appreciative of quick and efficient efforts to limit exposure. Uh, there are some uh, that either don't understand or are struggling with as we all would, not being able to see their families. So we have implemented technology solutions that allow them to get face-to-face -face virtually through a myriad of different devices and making sure that all of that is HIPAA compliant. We have isolated people so that exposure to others' environments is eliminated. From a staffing perspective, one of our first concerns that we began to solve was how they could maintain their standard of living. Uh, DSPs are not only critical, and most organizations throughout the state are minimized with respect to the amount of staff they have, they're short staff, they're working a lot of overtime. In an environment like this, now we have vocational staff who need hours. And in an isolation scenario where you're not allowing visitors and people aren't leaving for their day programming, we wanted to make sure that those who were working with developmental disabilities in a supported employment environment could do so until they were unable through state order or otherwise. 
but then those who are working in our vocational array could also fit in in what we call a normalized way or a new normal into a schedule. And for many of those uh, in northern Ohio, we have snow days. We have days where we have to stop vocational programming and switch schedules, and, and there are day attachments. Uh, what we did immediately was start to determine what those regular schedules would be, extend those out two, three, four weeks into the schedule, and make sure that our staff had advance notice of what their schedules would be. I think the communication was key to my team's efforts to make sure that our staff was calm, aware, felt part of those decisions, and could plan accordingly knowing that schools were most likely going to be impacted. And then once schools were impacted, we had to determine how to solve for, if you will, the daycare uh, issue. We've got a lot of employees who have children of all ages. Um, that is going to impact when they can work and if they can work, uh, how their daycare situation is handled. Unique scenarios popped up uh, within our staff, creating shift swap scenarios where some first and third would swap, we would get IST trained, people would give consistent care, but no one would lose their jobs. And I think that meaningful job safety and doing so in advance far enough in the future to plan has created an environment at Sunshine where we've been able to uh, maximize people's availability, uh, provide better care, and then include that unique day programming work that has been done in the background. The other staff that many of us are dealing with are uh, administrative, maybe transportation and drivers, uh, cooks, uh, medical appoint appointment uh, drivers, things like that. Um, there is a level of stress that hits the system when there is unknown. We mobilized to make sure that each and every staff was aware of what they could do to help the cause. We tried to determine those who were high risk that were office staff to make sure that while being present was key for leadership, to make sure that uh, the rest of our staff in myriad of locations were uh, not feeling isolated themselves, there are some that were at risk. And, and we devised plans to have meaningful work being performed remotely and them having the technology to do so. Amongst everything, and there is a ton that all of our agencies and peers are, are doing, I think the key has been probably not even the unique scenarios, the unique programming, the blizzard bag type activities, the technology for field trips, all of that is wonderful. And we hear stories uh, and we've got pictures and videos and staff sending in um, anecdotal evidence of the fun being had in homes. All of that goes for nothing without clear and consistent communication. And if we've learned anything over the last several weeks is keeping our staff informed, both from an organization standpoint, decisions we're making, why we're making them and when, but also from a public health perspective has been paramount. We have staff all across the state from several different socioeconomic backgrounds, their access to information, clear, consistent, and factual information is varied. They are often going home explaining to their families information that we've provided that they wouldn't get otherwise, and I think that's been appreciated. Before closing, I would like to mention that one of the keys that we're looking out for as a larger provider in the state, as a larger nonprofit provider, is this phase two implementation that does not apply to large organizations of over 500, but also those who are over 500, but nonprofit. And I think all of us need to be mindful that the system we work in is at a very, very tentative spot. We were under-resourced before this outbreak, and any one moment in time could push us over the edge to isolate larger nonprofits as one of the only or one of the few categories that are not included in any of the three phases of the, of the federal assistance would be, I think, quite dangerous. We're a little worried, uh, not because of the intent. The intent of all of this is positive. But we're a little worried that 
one move one way or another as an outbreak hits a community anywhere, whether it be Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton, or, or wherever, you're going to have large providers that have done everything correctly to the best of their ability. There is no playbook for this, but are then left out, and the ones who really get hurt are our DSPs. Our DSPs are going to be potentially out of work, isolated, and have no federal assistance because they happen to work for a large provider who's a nonprofit. So. I'll close with that and, and be happy to answer any other questions. Hi, my name is Kathy Phillips. I'm a provider of several waiver services in multiple counties. But today I am calling in to represent the provider organization, the Ohio Waiver Network. This is a horribly sad time in the world, but I have never seen our field more connected and supportive of each other. We have all pulled together for the same cause. The care and safety of those we care for is front and center. Calls from the county board have all contained questions such as, how are you with supplies? Are you good with staff? And what can we do to help support you? Particular counties like Cuyahoga County has dropped off supplies to providers in the Cleveland area. Things like gloves, wipes, hand sanitizers, and toilet paper all things that we thought we would never have to concern ourselves with need. Columbiana County, Josh Martin, calling providers after hours to make sure that we had staff coverage and to see if there was any way that the county board could help. Also, the SSA Department for Columbiana County has been supplying lists of companies that if we need to supplies or we run out, that we can also get them from them. Mahoning and Trumbull County Superintendents, Bill Whitaker and Ed Stark, conducted a video chat to help answer all providers' questions and help to calm fears. Trumbull County will be distributing supplies to providers on Monday that will help them through this. Also sending out several emails with daily support and great information as to the direction we are looking to go. Mahoning County Emily Martinez has been very clear in her communication that has put the needs of those we serve and our staff first with sending out information to make sure that we understand that we're all in this together. Stark County Superintendent Bill Green has reached out to providers to also show their county support. I received a call the other day from Bridget Garkin from the Ohio Association of County Boards. She reached out to make sure that our membership was aware that the county boards were all here to support us and to let us know that if there was anything they could do, they were just a phone call away. For the first time, I've seen providers openly communicate with each other and share staff together and not have that fear and supplies even where it's needed to, to provide the care we need. After meeting with my administration the other day, one of them emailed me back and said, we are prepared and fearless because we have a fearless leader that understands what we do every day. Our director, Jeff Davis, has displayed an amazing strength to pull all of us together very early on in this crisis and to listen to us, to take part of what we all said on those calls and create a direction for all of us to follow as one team to support those we serve. In this crisis, we have shown that we can all pull together and support each other in ways we never thought imaginable. So once this crisis has passed, my hope is that we can all continue on the same path to show each other the kind of support we are currently. My thoughts are just imagine if we can create what we have now and push aside all the silo thinking that we sometimes do and focus on the value of what we can do as a unified team to support each other. 